patient walks into the doctor's office for their annual checkup. As soon as they walk in and the door closes behind them, they turn to the doctor and say, Hey, doc, I honestly have no idea why I'm here today. I personally feel like I'm wasting your time and mine by being here because I am perfectly healthy. I've never been as healthy as I am right now in this moment. I may just be one of the healthiest patients you have ever had for as long as you've practiced medicine. That's a bold self-assessment to claim that level of health for oneself. Now you might think to yourself, wow, what an amazing blessing it would be to be that healthy. But before you think that, you need to know that I left out an important piece of this scene that makes this patient's self-assessment of their own health quite puzzling. You see, the state this patient was in when they walked into the doctor's office that day was shocking, to say the least. They didn't even really walk in. It was more of a hobble. That's because their leg was broken and they were using crutches to get around. This patient was morbidly obese. They had open wounds all over their body that were festering bright yellow jaundiced eyes and they were sweating profusely they were holding a bag of mcdonald's in one hand and two lit cigarettes in the other two at the same time i've never seen that before and this was the state the patient was in when they told their doctor that they were the pinnacle of human health what would a good doctor do in this situation after the initial shock wore off that is Would they play along and agree with their patient's self-assessment and then stamp their form indicating that the patient was leaving the office that day with a clean bill of health? Of course not. No good doctor would do that. A good doctor would explain to the patient as clearly as they could that the patient is objectively unhealthy. And if extreme precautions weren't taken immediately, the patient would run the risk of spiraling out of control to the point where their very life could be lost. And a good doctor would implore the patient to get to a hospital as soon as humanly possible to get the help that they needed. Doesn't matter what a person believes about themselves, even if what they believe about themselves isn't true. This is the scene that we're jumping into as we pick up our study in the book of James. But in James' case, he's not dealing with people who are making delusional self-assessments about their physical health. James is writing to a group of people, and it appears that some within that group may have been making inaccurate self-assessments about their own spiritual health. And James writes to them in the hope of showing them what true spiritual health looks like objectively. The book of James is a letter addressed to believers in the first century who have fled their homes because of persecution. James writes about a variety of issues in this book that they need to be taught, reminded of, and encouraged and challenged to do. And there were some people in the churches James wrote his letter to that thought they were doing pretty good in their relationship with Jesus. They thought they were spiritually healthy. They thought they were religious. But in reality, the opposite was true. Some of these people who James had in mind when he wrote his letter actually had a religion that was useless. And here's the scary part. They didn't even know it was useless. They were deceiving themselves. James writes the section of scripture we are looking at tonight with these people in mind, attempting to shed some light on their situation so that they could see what was really going on. But James isn't speaking just to them. The words that God inspired James to write down for the church back then are timeless words that speak just as clearly to the church today. The words we are about to read are for any of those among us who think they are religious but aren't, who claim to be spiritual but are not, who claim to be Christians even and potentially are not. Listen to what James writes in James chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. If anyone, and some of the ancient manuscripts add, among you, if anyone among you thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this 
to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Like the unhealthy patient in the doctor's office who thought that they were healthy even though they were objectively not, There were people in the church in James' day who claimed to be religious even though they were objectively not. James is addressing those who claimed to be religious but who didn't control their tongue, didn't take care of orphans and widows in their distress, and didn't keep themselves unstained from the world. And we see James introduce four major subjects here in just these two verses, And he's going to unpack these major subjects in greater detail later on in in this same letter. So we're not going to dive into each of them in great detail here in this message tonight. But these are the four major subjects he introduces. One, the relationship between faith and works. Two, controlling the tongue. Three, showing mercy to the helpless among us. And four, loving God versus loving this world. In this message, we're going to focus on only one main idea. We are going to look at how the practice of the Christian religion reveals if the saving work of Jesus has taken place in a person's heart. What people do reveals what they believe. The religion people practice indicates the kind of faith that they have. A faith that saves or a faith that is useless. Now, the word religion is not a word used frequently in the Bible, believe it or not, but it's used three times here in our passage, and it shows up in only a couple other places in the New Testament. It's used so infrequently because the word religion was just as vague of a word in James' day as it is in ours today. Religion, by definition, is the belief in and worship of a superhuman power or powers, especially a god or gods. His definition is vague, but the gist of it's plain. What you believe will determine what your worship will look like. And according to this definition, everyone on the planet, everyone on the planet is religious. Even those who claim not to be religious are religious according to the definition of the word. Because everybody believes in a superhuman power or powers, and everyone worships the superhuman power or powers they believe in everyone. Although what one believes will vary from person to person, everyone believes in an origin story. Everyone has a belief about how our universe and our lives came into existence. Everyone believes there is a source of the universe, and everyone orders their life around what they believe. That's what worship is. Worship is the outflow of our life based upon what we believe in. That's religion in a nutshell. Worship and religion are basically one and the same. If you practice a religion, you worship. If you worship something, you are practicing a religion. And everyone practices a kind of religion. Everyone chooses to spend their time, their money, their energy, their life according to what they believe about life. Those who don't believe the God of the Bible is real believe in something else instead. There is no belief vacuum. Everyone believes something. And if you don't believe in the God of the Bible, then whatever else you believe in, that is what you worship. The list of things that people can believe in and worship other than God includes, but is not limited to, false gods, demons, idols, science, nature, a.k.a. Mother Earth, a.k.a. the universe, or themselves just to name a few. Those who claim to believe in the power of the universe, I'm going to pick on anyone. If you you believe in that, just be patient with me. (laughs) Those who claim to believe in the power of the universe don't actually worship the universe. It's very important to understand this. They just say they do. It's just a ploy. It's just a cover-up. Saying you believe in the universe as some sort of supernatural power is just a way to camouflage self-worship. It's a great system to use if you want to worship yourself without ever having to say out loud that you worship yourself. You can just say that you worship the universe instead. Those who believe in the universe just live their lives however they want to live them, and then they thank the universe for letting them do whatever they want to do. But the universe didn't let you do anything. 
The universe doesn't actually speak to you. The universe doesn't tell you what to do and what not to do. The universe doesn't hold you accountable to anything. The universe is completely silent. So you can just do whatever you want. You can worship yourself. You can do what you want, when you want, how you want, with whom you want, and there is no one who can tell you if you're right or if you're wrong because there's nobody out there who can tell you you're wrong because they can't hear the universe either. No one can hear the universe because the universe isn't a person. It doesn't have a mind, a will, emotions. You can't have a relationship with the universe. All you can do with the universe is use it to justify however you want to live your life. It is a religion, though. It's a belief that affects how a life is spent. And by definition, Christians obviously are a religious people. Christians believe in God, and we worship him with our entire lives. That's the essence of what a religion is. The difference between Christianity and every other religion is that Christianity is based upon the truth. It's a true religion. It's objectively true. Jesus is the truth. He claimed to be God come down to us in human form. He validated his claims by his life and his ministry. His teaching and his miracles proved he was and is God. And the cherry on top was his physical resurrection from the dead. When he was crucified and his dead body was placed in a tomb, he didn't stay dead. Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. And all of this was written down in history by eyewitnesses who saw Jesus alive after he was dead. It happened. And this means that Christianity is the only true religion because Jesus ruled out every other religion by what he said about himself. Jesus said of himself that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. Jesus Christ of Nazareth said that faith in him is the only way a person can come to God. So unless a person comes to Jesus, they can't come to God. And that's what Christians believe because we just simply take Jesus at his word. Right? We sung that on the front end. <laughs> we take him at his word. And those who believe in Jesus worship Jesus. We take our lives and we spend our lives for him. We worship him with our entire life. Now the fact that Christianity is by definition a religion means that after today we have to put one of our favorite Christian cliches to bed. We can't use it anymore. You know which one I'm talking about? Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. Now I get it. I understand. I understand what Christians are trying to emphasize when they use this phrase with people. They want people to know that Christianity is not a dead, lifeless religion. It's just not a set of rules of things you can do and things you can't. Instead, it's an actual, real, living relationship with God who is a person who has a will of his own, emotions of his own, a nature and a character of his own. God is not the universe because God cr is the creator of the universe. And he has a personality which the universe does not. This is all true. Christianity isn't any less than that. It's just that by definition, Christianity is a religion too. It's a beautiful, life-giving, life-empowering religion. It's a religion that defines how we live as believers in Jesus. It's a religion that defines for us what our worship of him is to consist of. Because we don't worship Jesus the same way people worship the universe. We don't create our own ways of worshiping him. And then get him to co-sign what we've come up with. We worship him according to how he wants to be worshipped. We do what Jesus says in every area of our life. That's worship. And this is what James is addressing in his letter to his audience. There were people in the church who claimed to be religious, who claimed to believe in Jesus, but who weren't worshiping Jesus as they should have. And although they self-identified as being religious people, James said that their kind of religion was useless. That's a terrifying critique to receive. <laughs> to hear that the religion one practices is of no use. <laughs> well, no use of what? The 
practice of a useless religion is a sign that a person may not have put their faith in Jesus Christ in a saving way. The practice of true religion, true Christianity, reveals whether or not a person has come to truly know the Lord Jesus Christ. This is one of the main arguments James makes is in his entire letter. The argument that faith without works is dead. Or to put it another way, belief without true religion is dead. Faith that produces a useless religion in a person's life is not a saving faith. This is what James is concerned about. Let me show you in our text that James has a person's salvation in mind when he's talking about their religion being useless. So it's going to be back on the screen, James 1, verse 26. And I have a particular word underlined. But James says, If anyone thinks he's religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless. And he deceives himself. It's a useless religion. It doesn't do anyone good, especially the one practicing it. Now, if you have your Bibles open, you can look there or on the screen, one chapter over in the same book, James chapter 2, verse 20, for a parallel thought using a similar but different Greek word for useless. James 2.20, he goes on, he's a senseless person. Are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Faith without works or faith without a true religion is useless. But still the question remains, does this mean that a person who claims to be religious but isn't, is, an, is actually in danger of not being saved? What well, can a useless faith save anyone? I think that's exactly what James is concerned about. And I come to this conclusion because of the way the Apostle Paul uses the same word useless in one of the letters that he wrote to the Christians in Corinth. And Paul connects useless faith to not being saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17, also on the screen, Paul says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, which is the same Greek word as useless used in James 1.26. Your faith is worthless, it's useless, and then what does he say? You are still in your sins. A useless, worthless religion is a dead religion. A useless, worthless religion indicates that a faith is, is a useless and worthless, and a useless and worthless faith is a dead faith. And the one who practices such a religion is at a very real risk of not having a life-saving relationship through faith in Jesus Christ. That person is at risk of still being in their sins even though they don't think they are. That's what James is concerned about. People in the church claiming to know Christ but denying that they know him but the, by the way that they live. I'm going to take some time right now to walk us slowly through the stages of how Jesus saves a person and changes them how a real saving faith leads to the practice of true religion. Because I don't want anyone to be confused about what they are hearing tonight. And I also don't want anyone to worry unnecessarily about their lives if they don't need to worry. I only want those to worry who should be worried. So here's a simple walkthrough of how Jesus saves us and changes us. So here is the order. Step number one, you have to hear the gospel. You have to just hear the good news. You have to be exposed to it. And we all were before we were saved. Somebody tells you the good news of the life, the death on the cross for sins, the burial, and the physical resurrection of Jesus. This message is the power of salvation to anyone who believes it, and you have to hear it before you can believe it. So that's just step one, hearing the good news. Hearing it doesn't mean you're automatically saved but you can't be saved apart from hearing it. So step one, you hear the gospel. Step two, you believe the good news in your heart and you're saved and the Holy Spirit comes in. So when you hear the gospel, you don't reject the gospel message when you hear it. You hear it and you believe it. You say yes, yes, and yes, amen, amen, amen. And here's super important, the moment you believe it, before you do anything good, before you do any, anything religious, before you memorize your first memory verse, 
or before you walk an old lady across the street with her, with her groceries, before you do anything, anything in the name of Jesus, the moment you hear and you believe in your heart, that's when God saves you. That's the moment he saves you. Your sins are forgiven. You're cleansed and your sins are removed. Guilt and shame are gone. And God's spirit comes to live inside you, empowering you now. Now, now you have the power to live the life that he's calling you to live. And all this happens the moment that you believe. You haven't done anything religious at this point. You simply believe, and that belief in Jesus makes you right with God. It's the best deal. <laughs> it's the best deal you're ever going to be offered. Now, that's only step two, right? You've believed it, and you're born again, the Bible says. Step three, you confess that you've believed the gospel with your mouth, and you get baptized. It's kind of a two-part step. But if you've believed the gospel, and you've been saved by Jesus, you don't keep that a secret. You tell somebody. And when another believer hears your confession that you put your faith in Jesus, they baptize you. A believer's baptism identifies them as a person who has heard and believed the gospel. You guys following with me so far? That's step three. Now, step four. It's a longer step, but now step four, you begin to live your new life as a Christian in a way that reflects the change that Jesus has worked in you. Jesus comes to live inside those who believe in him. And his presence in us empowers us to live for him. The way we live for him from that moment forward indicates that we have believed in him and that his power lives in us now. This is so important. We, please hear me, we don't live a religious life in order to get Jesus to save us. We live a religious life to show the evidence that he has saved us. And this is not in my notes, but it should have been. When he comes in and saves you, when he gives you the power to live for him and to obey him and to worship him with your life, are you going to obey him and worship him perfectly from that day forward? No, 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 no. <laughs> you're going to grow in obedience. You're going to grow in worship. You're going to grow in the way you express your love for him. But you're going to fall on your face a lot spiritually. <laughs> You're going to take a step forward sometime and three steps back. You're going to reach a mountaintop and then you're going to fall off a cliff. <laughs> you're going to climb up again and maybe get a little higher next time and then fall hopefully not so far down, but you're going to go like this, right? You're going to go forward and then back, right? Who could testify to that if you've been a Christian for any amount of time? Okay. It's important because some people will believe the lie that I've I'm a Christian and I've made a mistake. It doesn't reflect the way that Jesus wants me to live. And they're going to wonder, if, am I a Christian or not? Because I made a mistake. That's not the way that it works. You take the sum total of a Christian's life, whether they've been following Christ for a minute, an hour, a day, or a decade. And you look at the sum total of their life. And can you see the trajectory of a changed life? That now they're living a life that's different than they were before they met Christ. Okay, this brings us back now to the two verses we are looking at tonight. So what's the connection between a saving faith in Jesus and the practices James mentions in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27? Why does James mention controlling the tongue, taking care of orphans and widows in their distress, and keeping oneself unstained from the world? How do these religious practices, because that's what they are, how do these things specifically reveal that a person has come to know Jesus and has been saved by him? None of us can look directly into another person's heart to see what is there. Sometimes we think we can do that, but you can't. <laughs> we can't look into the spirit of a person to see if Christ resides in them or not. We aren't capable of doing that. But we can observe the things that they say and do in their life. And those things that a person says and does reveals what's inside their heart. Those things show us what's on, what's on the inside of a person. Jesus taught us this. He said it's not what goes into a person that makes them unclean, but what comes out of them, speaking of their words. It's going to be on the screen. Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 10. Somebody in the crowd, he told them, 
Listen and understand. It's not what goes into, into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Don't you realize that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a person. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual moralities, thefts, false testimonies, slander. These are the things that defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile a person. Jesus said that we can see into a person's heart through the words that come out of their mouth. And there's more. It's not just a person's words that reveal what's in their heart, but their actions show us what's in there too. Jesus says that you will know a tree by its fruit, speaking of a person's actions, speaking of their life. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you will recognize them by their fruit. Jesus is saying you'll be able to tell. A pers- you could differentiate people by the way they live their lives. That's what he is telling us. So according to Jesus, the things that people say and the things that they do, we'll call these things the religion that they practice. These things will reveal what's inside their hearts. These things will reveal if Christ is in them or not over the long haul. The words we say reveal what's in our heart. That's why controlling our tongue is such a big deal. As we go through the rest of the book of James in the weeks to come, we're going to see him address different ways that people in the church weren't controlling their tongue. There was a boasting that revealed bitterness and selfish ambition. They were cursing each other, criticizing one another, defaming and judging one another, complaining, swearing, not like F-bombs, but swearing like taking oaths with the intention of making their words appear to be more trustworthy. Do you know who has to do that? Liars. And it was a mess. And what can, we conclu- what can we conclude about a person who speaks in these kinds of uncontrolled ways? If someone has encountered the glory of the risen Christ and they had to humble themselves before his majesty in order to receive his forgiveness and his mercy, Can that same person go around in their life boasting to others about how important they are? Or can a person who has Jesus literally living on the inside of them look at another person who Jesus loved so much that he'd die on a cross to pay for their sins? Could this person then curse that person? Speak ill of that person? Criticize that person? Defame that person? The one that Christ let himself be crucified for? Or if someone knew that because of their own sins, they were on a one-way path headed straight for hell, but because Jesus saved them at the cost of his own life, could that same person now go on to spend the rest of their days on earth complaining incessantly of how bad their life is? You were going to hell because of your sins, and now you're going to heaven instead, forever, because of Jesus. You and I are allowed to have bad days. We are allowed to vocalize to another person when things are tough. That's okay. But it's not okay to live an entire life marked by complaining about how bad things are all the time. That kind of talk doesn't evidence that a person knows what they've been saved from and what they've been saved into. The words we say reveal what's in our heart. And the mercy we display reveals what's in our heart. There's never been a point in human history where it was desirable to become a widow or an orphan. Never. The circumstances that lead to that happening in a person's life are never good. But in James' day, being a widow or an orphan was worse than being one of those two today. It's true. 
There was no government assistance available to widows and orphans back then like there is for us. If your husband died and you weren't financially well off, then homelessness and starvation became a very real possibility for you. Same things if your parents died and you weren't old enough to take care of yourself, which happened a lot back then. Remember the context that this letter was written in. Persecution against the church had been unleashed. Some believers were thrown in prison and others were killed for following Jesus. And that widespread persecution produced widows and orphans inside the church. Now what kind of genuine religious practice done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would allow a person to look upon a widow or an orphan in the church who was also a spiritual brother or sister in Christ, who was homeless and starving, and then harden their heart and close their fist towards them? Would that kind of action indicate that a person has the love of Christ in their heart? No, it would reveal a heart that hasn't received mercy. Because the one who has received mercy from Jesus will show mercy to another person who needs it even if it requires sacrifice on our part to do it. Because that's how Jesus showed mercy to us, isn't it? Didn't, Jesus didn't just give us a small percentage off the excess and abundance of his life. Right? He wasn't a, like salt bay. He wasn't like mercy bay. He didn't sprinkle just a tiny little bit of mercy onto us. He didn't toss us the crumbs when he showed us mercy. He gave us the entire loaf of bread. He is the bread that came down from heaven. He sacrificed his whole entire life in order to show us mercy. And if that kind of extravagant mercy has touched our hearts, then it will flow from our hearts to those who need it. And we will minister to one another in tangible ways when there are any among us who are in distress, whether you have a husband, parents, or not. To not show mercy like that would indicate that something is wrong in us. It would reveal that there is something wrong with our faith. The words we say reveal what's in our heart. The mercy we display reveals what's in our heart. The things we agape reveal what's in our heart. The things we love in this life reveal what's in our heart. Christ saved you and me precisely from the repercussions of loving things in this world more than we loved him. That's what he died on the cross to cleanse us from. That's why he gave us new spiritual hearts with new desires when he saved us. When he saved us, he reprogrammed us to love him more than than the things that killed us in our previous life apart from him. That's what his spirit in us does. It produces a genuine love for Jesus that supersedes our love for the things of this world. So how are we to interpret it when a person claims to be religious, claims to be a Christian, and they continue to love the things in this world that Christ has expressly forbidden us from loving? Or, and this one is more sneaky, or they continue to love good and acceptable things in this world but they love those good and acceptable things more than they love Jesus. How are we to make sense of a life that claims to love Jesus, but then goes on to spend that life loving the things that Jesus had to die on a cross to save us from? It doesn't make any sense. And that is what James wants us to see. A person's walk has to match their talk. If a person claims to be a follower of Jesus, if they claim to be religious, then the words they say the mercy they display, and the things they agape will indicate if their self-assessment is accurate or not. So why does James write what he does in chapter 1, verse 26 and 27? A useless, impure, and defiled Christianity is no Christianity at all. And James is contending for the faith as his brother Jude talks about doing in the opening of his letter. James wants the church to embrace a useful, pure, and undefiled Christianity. A useless, impure, and defiled Christianity will make for a terrible experience for those who are part of a local church where that kind of religion is allowed to continue unchallenged. But a useful, pure, and undefiled Christianity 
will bless everyone who is a part of a local church who lives that kind of religion out. A useless, impure, and defiled Christianity is a terrible testimony of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. But a useful, pure, and undefiled Christianity shows the watching world how amazing Jesus truly is. A useless, impure, and defiled Christianity deceives the one who practices it into thinking they are right with God when in fact they are not. And a useful, pure, and undefiled Christianity is a strong testament to the one who practices it that they are right with God. And James doesn't want anyone who is deceived to remain deceived, and neither should we. So what are we supposed to do with this? Well, if you're a Christian and you're doing well, praise God for his grace in your life. Keep walking with Jesus and guard your heart from complacency. Minister to anyone you know who might be making false assessment, self-assessments of their own spiritual health. Don't just take people at their word. Don't be the doctor at the beginning of the message who hears his patient make the health claims about their life, but instead of challenging those claims, you affirm their false self-assessment instead. Don't do that. If you know someone who claims to walk with God, but they aren't actually walking with God, then let the final words of James' letter inspire you to intervene in their life on their behalf. James writes this to close his letter. He says, My brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So that's for those of you who know Christ and you're doing well. Praise God for that. But maybe you're a Christian and you're here tonight and you're not doing so good. Those types of Christians exist, by the way. All genuine Christians are that Christian at some point in their life. It's possible to walk off the path of following Christ. It's possible to truly belong to him and walk off the path just a little bit. And it's possible to truly belong to Jesus and walk off the path by a mile. Both are possible. And if you truly know him, but you have not been living a kind of life that reflects that you know him, then do what Jesus called Ephesian believers to do, recorded for us in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 4. Jesus says this to believers, But I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first, namely me. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Brother and sister, Jesus is calling you to repent. Turn from your disobedience and turn back to him. He will receive you. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will renew a right spirit in you. Our God is a God of second chances, third chances, seven times 70 chances. No matter how many times you've gone off course, come back today. Do that right now if the Spirit is convicting your heart in any way. And maybe you're here tonight and you're not a Christian yet. Become one today. <laughs> Repent of your sins for the first time today. Believe in Christ for the first time today. Give him all of your life to follow him all of your days. And come join a family that is dedicated to practicing true religion that shows the world just how awesome this Jesus we worship and we believe in really is. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. I'm going to invite Maureen and Heidi to come up. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that the good news of the gospel is incomprehensibly good. You did everything, everything, to make a way for people who don't deserve to be forgiven, be forgiven. You didn't put it on us to cleanse ourselves and to make us good enough. You died on a cross in order to pay for our sins, to pay the penalty of death that we deserved, and then you went into the grave and you came out of the grave on the third day, conquering the power of death for us. 
And all we have to do is take you at your word, believe in who you are, just believe what you did for us, and you will save us. You forgive us, and you cleanse us, and you make us a new person on the inside. And then all we do, Lord, is we don't pay you back for that, but out of the overflow of gratitude that you put into our hearts, we say thank you by living the rest of our lives trying to honor you. Do what pleases you. Do what blesses you. Do what you tell us to do. Do that more and more in our lives. Any of, any, any of us here, Lord, tonight who know you, that's the cry of our heart. We want to know you more. We want to worship you harder. <laughs> we want to bless your name. We want to walk with you and experience your presence in our life. We want to be used by you to see other people come into the kingdom. We want to help other people obey you and practice true religion. <laughs> Help us do that, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.